Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Ndidi Okonkwo Muneli. I'm a social entrepreneur based in Lagos, Nigeria. I wear a number of hats as the founder of Africa Food Change Makers, the co-founder of Sahel Consulting, um, and the co-founder of Ace Foods. So really invested in the ecosystem and food from farm to fork. But this session is not about me. It's really about these dynamic entrepreneurs. Um, and we've covered the world regions. Um, we're delighted to have on stage, you've already heard from Satya, on the main stage. Uh, we're, 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 we're bringing him down to the rest of us to be more accessible to hear his story. But Satya is the co-founder and president of Cosmos. He's going to be telling us a bit about his journey. We're also delighted to have Paulina Zendel, who is the co-founder and chief operating officer. Um, wears a number of hats of Talasso. And then last but not the least, we have uh, my Nigerian brother, even though he's based in Paris, Ayola Dominic, who is the co-founder and CEO of Coolbox. Um, this is really going to be a session about entrepreneurs driving change and ecosystem solutions from their home countries. And we're going to be discussing their stories, why they were energized and inspired to start their ventures, the challenges they've faced with scaling, um, the opportunities they see in the ecosystem, and what barriers we can co collectively dismantle as they scale. So without further ado, I'm just going to ask each of them to just share in a few minutes their story um, and how they got on this stage. So let's start with you, Satya. Uh, it being uh, women's International Women's Day, I think it's more fair <laughs> to start with her. Thank you. Thank All you right, so much. Go ahead. <laughs> so I am Paulina Sanela. I'm originally from Mexico. And uh, my startup is called Talasso. This is a Mexican Norwegian corporation with a circular blue economy approach. And our main objective is to collect sargasso seaweed. Probably if you live here in Miami, you have seen it. This is an invasive seaweed that is threatening over 48 countries worldwide. So when it lands by the beach and it starts decomposing, uh, it releases methane gases, it's destroying the livelihoods, ecosystems, and, and, and the economy of a lot of these coastal communities. So what we are doing is developing these uh, autonomous harvesting vessels to prevent the beach landing. So we collect it before it does the damage. And then very interestingly, we found, found out that seaweed is being farmed all over the world for several purposes. And in the Caribbean region and in Miami, we're receiving tons and tons and tons of it for free, and we're treating it as garbage. So we developed a microbio refinery where we are extracting high value ingredients from the seaweed, and we are producing biofertilizers with the remaining. So this is a circular approach. So we're turning the problem into an opportunity for the coastal communities. Terrific, thank you. All right, Satya. Right. Um, I started my journey in food systems as a farmer, and from there I went on uh, understanding the root cause. I started an enterprise which uh, today builds world's most affordable micro greenhouses. We call it greenhouse in a box. A greenhouse with farm services to help small and marginal farmers in hot climates, to start with India, grow food using 2% water and with that by using one tenth of one tenth of an acre of land they get to double their current income levels and get that income to be climate resilient so this is what uh, we'll actually do wonderful and Ayola yeah first of all thank you very much uh, great opportunity to be here um, just to give you a quick context um, so in in sub-saharan Africa we have over uh, 600 million people the lack access to electricity and therefore lack access to refrigeration. Now, uh, as compared to what you see around here in Miami, in America, and Europe, where you have 100% penetration in refrigeration, in sub-Saharan Africa, it's only 17%. So that means if you have uh, 100 restaurants, 100 uh, frozen food stores, 100 pharmacies, uh, only 17 of them would actually have refrigeration. And, um, and when they have these refrigerators, they're actually outdated. What that means is they consume about two to three times more than the average electricity. And what that means inadvertently is that 
um, looking at the growth rates in sub-Saharan Africa, the average income earning is growing by the day. And then when you look at the heat wave, particularly I heard a lot of conversations around heat wave even in Miami. You can imagine uh, what would happen in sub-Saharan Africa with all those refrigerants if we allow refrigerators to be in heavy home and they are not sustainable refrigerators. So this is where Coolbox comes in. So using the force of um, sun and water, we created a solution that is able to generate refrigeration for up to four days, whether or not you have power supply. And we did this by storing energy in the form of ice rather than just in batteries, making it more affordable for the peculiar type of people we serve. We went beyond that and we thought, what good is an innovation if no one can afford it? So what we did was we integrated in these units a pay-as-you-go technology that allows individuals, mom and pop shows next door, to be able to pay $10 to own a refrigerator every month. So that is what we do. I hope it's not too long, but basically I just thought I should give you context before I talk about it. Thanks. Thank you so much. So we have a full spectrum from seaweed to greenhouses in a box and refrigeration. Um, and these are all dynamic young people who took a risk, who had an idea, and um, obviously you're sitting on this stage, so it means you've gained some traction. So let's come back to you, Pauline. What has the traction been? How are people receiving your technology? Um, have you found the market for your fertilizer? And give us a s sense of how big your operation is now and your pathway to scaling. Yeah, so yes, we have a lot of traction from the beginning. And so we are strategically partnered with Norwegians who are developing this marine technology, but we also have a, like a great team of engineers developing the refining part in Mexico. So the traction has been amazing, like in both sides. We have 16 different investors in place. We're building the prototype of both. Uh, we have LOIs in place with the government of Barbados, with the government of Antigua and Barbuda, with Grupo Punta Cana in Dominican Republic, talking to many other of the affected countries. So the market is quite big because the cleaning of the beaches, that is something that needs to be done with both governments and hotel uh, industry. So we, we are in constant communication with them. Actually, the development of our technology was adapted to their needs. So our first, uh, and I think this is this is something important to mention, our first approach was a bigger solution, like tanker ships harvesting offshore, but then talking to governments, uh, to environmental groups and so on, we had to adapt the technology to what is actually required. So now we have uh, like 10 different clients aligned, waiting for the, the technology to be out and ready. Fantastic. So when you say we, what is your role in this and how have you overcome all these obstacles? Hello, eyes with governments? Yeah. <laughs> People waiting for your technology? I'm investors, how many? 16 so 16. far. 16. I yeah. mean, that's pretty remarkable. I thought you guys would be excited. <laughs> so how did you overcome all the obstacles that we know exist for women still in this landscape? Um, yeah. And what is your secret sauce? <laughs> so I think a little bit of my background, I worked for six years for federal government in Mexico. So there is this thing that I understood. Sometimes we entrepreneurs and nonprofit organizations and government have the same exact exact mission but we speak different languages so one of the challenges of course is to communicate that our mission is the same mission to impact uh, people in a positive way and and that we're not fighting like this is not a fight against each other this is a fight to like achieve a goal and yes sometimes especially in mar maritime sector there's not a lot of women I'm a co-founder and COO. My CEO is uh, Frude is, is a man. So we also collaboration. Like sometimes you have to understand you, you can present, but maybe some people rather talking to men. It's okay. Like we have to be fight for our place, but also be flexible enough to understand that the final cause or the final impact is much more important than one self ego. So just make things happen. Just take action. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Well done. You know, I had a speech earlier today, International Women's Day, and I hit on what you just said, wisdom. You have to have wisdom as an entrepreneur to know which battles are worth fighting 
and how to fight them. And I think this point on private-public partnerships for scaling is critical. And, and you mentioned that yesterday, Satya, as you ended your remarks on stage, you said we need to start thinking about government in a different way as a partner. How have you scaled in partnership with the government? Well, um, like I mentioned yesterday uh, in my talk, we did meet with more than 20 banks, 30-plus uh, government officials, and entered into seven agreements to scale. Well, I'm glad for you. It's not an easy thing to do. To Signing actually is probably one step of the hurdle, but operationalizing after signing is a challenge in itself. It's a world in itself. And they sign, they say something, but actually when it comes to operationalizing it, we suddenly realize that there are roadblocks every step. So what we have done is, you know, initially first four years, we spent a lot of time on farmer financing. Uh, we thought that is, I mean, there's no question. Uh, even though uh, we got a $60,000 technology down to $800, $800 is a lot of money for somebody who is making $800 per year, right? So uh, then without either financing or subsidy, there is no way smallholder farmers who rightly need to use that technology and get benefited from that, there's no way they would actually get benefited. So I spent quite some time on financing. We made progress. There are people who continue to have uh, agreements with us. But what we did realize is... Um, in early stages, there is a lot of expectation from the enterprise to support the uh, banks and financial institutions in recovery. So it's like, hey, hang on, we are here to build a technology and uh, you know get this out to the farmers, but probably this is not a muscle that we are prepared for. That's just asking too much of us. And then uh, we realize that the next best way to probably look at scaling is mimic subsidy and get the solution to prove itself at scale. And for that, we were lucky enough to have uh, got gotten support from incredible organizations across the world uh, who fund us today uh, to actually help us mimic subsidy and uh, scale the solution. So while there is a part of our effort which is still proving a market-based solution, again, think about it. If there is a 100% ROI, or let us say in one to one and a half years, you are able to completely recover your investment from a pure business sense. It's, it makes yeah, it makes sense. I think people should just you know invest into it. But the point is when the access to capital is a challenge for the segment of uh, population that we are talking about, then we are having to reimagine the way we look at it. We're trying to mimic subsidy and create a persuasive case that, hey, by subsidizing this asset, we are able to create this impact on this population from government's point of this is still with private philanthropy if government starts putting its dollars into this business then for a dollar that government invests in terms of gdp we look at per dollar three to four dollars of return that government can get in terms of gdp contribution we are trying to create a persuasive case even in that regard and see how we can stitch those collaborations so you have touched on something we started discussing yesterday, which is the role of catalytic financing, patient capital. And those of you who are in the room yesterday remember this part of the discussion. Um, so the argument you've made is we need patient, maybe grant financing to prove our business case before it becomes mainstream. I would say, I mean, or part both. of it part of it could be grant financing. Mm -hmm. Part of it for a business could be working capital. Right. See. The, the deficit which has to be funded for the asset which reaches the last mile consumer, unless we are lucky enough like you to just turn it off as a pay-as-you-go model, right? So, which is, a, which, is, which is a great technology in itself. If we don't have that uh, advantage, we still need to figure out when the asset is out there, how do we make sure that deficit gets covered through a grant, you know, till the asset proves itself. Right. And so, how many greenhouses have been purchased about, to date? Uh, now we are reaching close to 1800 1800 and is it have you broken even well in terms of gross margin uh, wherever we are uh, doing a market price selling yes we are able to have a gross margin but of course there are many more uh, layers to it where we say hey i think there is growth spending there is r d spending which still makes us require uh, additional funding fantastic ayala what about you 
Just give us a sense. I told her, I'm Nigerian. You know, I, I come to many of these platforms and we celebrate entrepreneurs. I'm sure you guys understand. And when we get to the home countries, we can't see evidence of their work. Um, and no, nobody on the stage is one of those. But I told her, I'm going to go and look for your fridges because I want to make sure that if I'm interviewing you, there are entrepreneurs yeah, using it. Because honestly, we incentivize in the ecosystem hype True. around ideas, around True. scaling. True. Um, and Ayola assures me that there are places that I'll find his fridge. True. So tell us, how have you scaled? What have been the biggest obstacles you faced and how have you surmounted them? Okay, thank you very much, yeah. So again, I repeat, you can go to Jarrah Market to Lagos. <laughs> you find the phrases there. So uh, thankfully today we've been able to, uh, in the past, I'll say three years, we've gone with an average of 3x multiples year on year. Uh, we started with um, about 500 units. We scaled to 2,000 now as of last year. We had 4,000 units. Uh, we're in 18 countries at the moment uh, with two major countries in focus, which is Nigeria and Kenya. Uh, Nigeria contributes about, I would say, about 60% of the total revenue for Coolbox. Uh, currently, we have partners like Orange, Orange Network is for those in French-speaking Africa. You probably know them. Uh, we serve customers like Danone. Danone is a big French brand. Probably you, you know them. And uh, we've been fortunate enough to say that, um, basically, um, we had a, a very interesting one with the Delta State government, where we had to supply our, our freezers uh, on the cooling as a service during the COVID uh, for, for the Healthcare Ministry of Health. Um, so those are the uh, few tractions we've had. And um, in terms of um, uh, fundraising, because I think that's also part of it, we just closed the seat round of about $2.5 million. We're currently closing the $33 million Series A, uh, hopefully to be done in March. We really want to make refrigeration accessible to everyone. So we are thinking of building a local assembly uh, in this country to make it affordable because we've seen the challenges we have globally with supply chain. And that for us is absolutely important. Make it accessible, make it affordable to everyone that needs to buy it. Now in terms of challenges, uh, one of them is what I call um, uh, cost versus uh, versus quality. Uh, because when you look at the, the, the nature of the people we serve, and when we look at quality, uh, for every increase in quality comes an increase in cost. And then there's this chicken and egg, uh, how, to what extent can you increase the cost when you're dealing with uh, this type of, um, our, our kind of people? So, um, and so that's the first question. Um, so, and then secondly, it's about um, infrastructure. Uh, we deal with freezers, we deal with fridges, like she said. And then when you think about logistics, where you have a, in a country where you have no good infrastructures in terms of road, uh, so, so that's a big problem. And then when it comes to maintenance challenges, when we deal with market women, mom and pop stores that have perishables in their freezers, and then the sun goes down and the freezer goes off, the next minute she's worried, she's old, she might have a potential because of that. How do you get to her in a minute? How do you get to her as fast as you can? So these are challenges we're facing in this kind of countries that we're going. Uh, but we're finding solutions around it. Like one of them is we're offering predictive maintenance now. We're offering what we call preventive maintenance, where we're able to use machine learning to understand the temperature of the refrigerators. And if there should be a problem in the next two days, we are aware of there should be a change in weather. We are aware and we get there before the customers even know. So those are kind of things we're, we're, we're working on to, to ensure that we, we take it to the next level. Yeah. Terrific. You have heard them, opportunities and challenges. And, and here, he is raising a, a, a second uh, Series A, and he's open to investments. I'm going to say that. Yeah, very, very <laughs> <laughs> and so is everyone on this stage, right? Yeah. But as you think about public-private partnerships, you started off with saying you have these relationships with governments. All of you have had to rely on the partnerships. What would you say is required for the ecosystem to change? We need entrepreneurs such as yourself in the thousands and even in the millions solving critical climate challenges. You've taken on the greenhouse issue, refrigeration, seaweed. But as we look at our ecosystem, there are opportunities everywhere. There are challenges, there are opportunities. What will it take to create an ecosystem that supports entrepreneurs such as yourself to start and scale businesses rapidly? that meet the needs in the climate landscape. So Pauline. Yeah, so I think one of the main challenges and probably you guys have faced it too, is to educate the investors on climate impact. 
and how it is not just like an alarmist uh, theory, it is a reality and how you can actually make money like this is yeah it has social impact environmental impact but it's also profitable and yeah it's uh, for us at least it has been a little bit complicated to find the right investors if not we have to just educate them and show them like okay this is a problem these are the challenges these are the opportunities and this is a ecosystem growing rapidly in europe uh, in the case of seaweed and how it it can grow even faster if we if we like replicate this in uh, the caribbean in latin america in the united states and many african countries have a seaweed problem uh, as so well. you Same can expand west africa yeah <laughs> west africa to exactly. nigeria yeah what about you um i think the way to turbocharge the climate solutions from a planet perspective for a moment let's keep the companies aside all these companies many more hundreds and thousands of micro innovations like this which start which are started by entrepreneurs like us after we get to a point of proving the technology for a moment if we just step back and ask this question for a moment if we are not focused on scaling the company just run a thought experiment we are not scaling the company we are trying to scale the solution because these are completely two different worlds trying to scale the company and trying to scale the solution are very different worlds so if we just step back and say hey how do i scale the solution to its greatest potential if the world's resources are infinite for a moment we are not talking about natural resources money is available in abundance it's just that it's not being deployed to the places that it has to go to so if we just take that approach and look at it there are these steps that i can clearly see which will turbocharge your journey first have an inventory of these innovations then second map out the uh, areas where these innovations will be the most appropriate to like for example you're talking about west africa not the central africa right which makes sense so map out the areas where those innovations will be appropriate and third get these stories out to uh, using the influencers public figures social media celebrities uh, you know celebrities social media influencers now i want to spend like 20 seconds to em ex uh, emphasize on the importance of this because the world changes people's perceptions change not because a scientist told something at scale things change because an influencer influenced somebody to do something differently this is the reality we need to suck up and then we actually will do things in the right way so this is the gravity this is the flow of motivation let us build a dam where the flow of motivation is then we will be able to harvest you know uh, enough and fourth the last thing is now that you warmed up the ecosystem and created right influence use bureaucrats when i say bureaucrats it could be ex bankers or ex government officials get them on your side to stitch the collaborations with governments or banks we cannot understand as an outsider what that world looks like you are a lucky person you have been there and here so not everybody is that has done that so we need to actually have them on our side to make sure we stitch those collaborations if we do these i believe we can co create solutions we can scale the solutions not just create we can scale the solutions to their potential across multiple geographies i think you've read my book <laughs> cuz i have business models for scaling demand driven data driven cost efficient ecosystem solution storytelling which is what you talked about with influencers the partnerships and then embedding uh resilience into your dna so which is critical now i'm wondering critical. who has to pay royalty to whom <laughs> <laughs> but you've you're hit, you've hit it on the head right and we're not just scaling solutions we're scaling ideas we're scaling movements we're scaling all of that to address the climate agenda and in your case you actually we we complain about pharmaceutical industries right when it comes to covid so send your technology to nigeria we'll replicate it right donate Tomorrow. it to countries all Tomorrow. over the world <laughs> that's one way to scale all right ayola what about you yeah uh, um to get the question your question is more around how to scale is that your just to be sure and to shape the ecosystem so that there are more entrepreneurs like you 
solving climate solution, uh, addressing climate solutions? Yeah, I, I think um, uh, for, from from a skill perspective, um, so I start with that. Um, technology is the only way we can scale our, our business. Um, uh, we've we've tried, and um, uh, the first to scale is always the first to win. So it depends on how fast you're able to scale, and we understand that fact, and that's why we're going hard even with our fundraising to ensure that we're able to get technology embedded. I'll give you a very good example. Um, uh, it's a very complex system, like I did say earlier, uh, because then you have logistics embedded uh, in a, an environment where the roads are not so good. Then you're talking about temperature monitoring, uh, where you have field networks, and then you have uh, what we'll call uh, billing systems, because we are on a pay-as-you-go. Uh, so what that means is uh, we're able to cut off, like he said, the customer if the customer doesn't pay. But the good news is he or she has about four days because of the technology, which is the ice batteries, uh, to pay. You know, So those are ways through which we think it can scale. So if we're able to integrate this in a single platform, uh, obviously, and we get it well, we'll be able to scale. And that's what we're doing. In fact, we slow down sales. We don't have a problem. Fortunately for us, we don't really have a problem explaining the problem to people, uh, to investors, fortunately. Uh, I think our major problem has been uh, the ability to scale, what you just said. How do we scale this business? How do we scale this product? And we figured out the only way to do that is technology. And that's what we're working on. We actually stopped sales right now. We, we, we slow down sales because the demand is there. It's a huge opportunity. We're solving the problem, majorly women. Um, small businesses that require refrigeration for income generation, and we have quite a number of them, mom and pop shops everywhere. So the challenge is majorly about how to scale the business, and we think the only way to do that is technology. And um, in other, uh, how for us generally, for other uh, startup um, um, entrepreneurs, I think our, our goal is creating a sustainable business. And um, if you want to create a sustainable, creating a scalable business would mean you have to create a sustainable business. And uh, a sustainable business would mean you know, empowering people socially and financially. So if you have that at, at the back of your mind at every point in time, that if you want to have a scalable business, you want to have a sustainable business, and you must be able to empower people socially and financially, then I think you're close to it. That's my one goal, yeah. Terrific, you wanted to add? Yeah, mm -hmm. I just want to add a couple of points to this. Um, I was saying something very similar till a few years ago. And uh, more recently, my understanding of this, I feel, got a little more nuanced. A pair at scale, I mean, again, this was through a fellowship that I underwent. A pair for a product or service at scale, sometimes we, I mean, j as an entrepreneur, we always wish, ideally, without hassle, let the customer pay. That's the easiest case uh, for us. But for the kind of problems we are solving, we are not running behind the solved problems. We are running behind unsolved problems. We are talking about unmet and unarticulated needs of people. These are really hard. So in scenarios like this, sometimes to stay mission aligned, we have to, re we have to keep asking ourselves this question. Is the customer the payer at scale? Is government the payer at scale? Is big aid the payer at scale? You know, or is private philanthropy the payer at scale? Who is the payer at scale? Because it's not uh, it's not obvious in all scenarios for all products at all phases of the uh, journey that there is only one payer at scale. And that understanding also helps us, you know, really ground the solution uh, in the right direction without compromising on the impact. Otherwise, my concern is the same net houses, greenhouses in a box, what we sell, if we were to just sell to affluent farmers, we could have done millions and billions of dollars of business just going that route. Versus if we are mission aligned only to take it to smallholder farmers is when I need to wrestle with how do they get financing? Yeah, if they don't get financing, how do we figure out subsidy? So that's one small point I wanted to add to what my friend said. But I would also add that it depends on the context. In some contexts, it's going to be the government. In another context, it might be an off-taker or a blue ocean program that's highly subsidized because we need fish in that community. So I think it will vary, and we have to be open to different permutations of entrepreneurial growth 
um, listening to the customer, the context, and the how the ecosystem is evolving. So at this point, we're going to open it up to all of you. I'm sure you have questions, comments, suggestions. Um, plus, raise your hand, introduce yourself, and the mic will be passed to you. We have one right here in the front. Hi, how's it going? Uh, my question is for Paulina. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I'm also a, um, I came from the federal government, uh, US. Um, I also started an NGO in Mexico, and then I realized it was very hard to fund that NGO. So then I created um, a for-profit also around Sargassum. So I just want to take the time to um, thank you for what you're doing because like this space is so novel and so niche, you know, like there are only probably like, I, you know, four or five people, you know, around the world doing this. Um, so thank you for like, you know, sort of like being a trailblazer. Um, I had a sort of thinking that, so when I was in Mexico, I noticed that like most of the most profitable and the richest farmland was sort of in the hands of like Mennonites and, and you know, other groups that weren't with, uh, weren't like, you know, Mayan uh, community groups. And so I developed my for-profit model where that like I wanted to sort of use the profits to like give the fertilizer back to like Mayan farmers for like almost free or like really cheap and stuff. So I was wondering if you were working on something like, like that and, and can you talk a little bit more about the fertilizer and, and how you try to approach it as a business and stuff? Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, Thank absolutely. And congratulations on your work as well. Uh, we like to say that Sarayaso people, we're a family. We're so little, uh, as you said, probably more than five uh, all over the Caribbean and so on. Uh, but it is so we're helping each other there is no such thing as competitors we all need to work and we all need to work fast before Sargasso finishes with the Caribbean region and West Africa so uh, yes we do have we we have this strong belief that the ocean sent Sargasso like a symbol like hey humans pay attention stop hurting me so bad with like relying on on sustainable tourism and do something in balance with me so we uh, one of the main things that we care about is coastal communities so we do have this program where we train uh, women to produce the fertilizer because it's actually you must know this it is actually pretty simple to produce the fertilizer from Sargasso there are some challenges regarding the heavy metal content in some of the batches of Sargasso so there is where the science comes. So we uh, we like to um, like we have this program where we take uh, co women from the communities, help them uh, with the tools uh, to produce the the fertilizer, but also with commercial tools, eco entrepreneurship uh, like uh, knowledge, so they can also distribute and take a piece of that uh, revenue. In reality, the production of uh, seaweed uh, fertilizer, there's a big market for it. It's normally kelp seaweed, which we, we call Sarayaso the ugly sister of kelp because nobody wants her, but it comes from the same family. <laughs> yeah. So the kelp fertilizer, it's like uh, 10 times the price that you can give the, the other one. So you can make a profit for the local communities through women uh, while you still make some revenue. We have 20 million tons of uh, Sargasso seaweed, and the market for biofertilizer bio is massive. So, yeah, but uh, in the end of the session, I would love to talk more with you. <laughs> Wonderful. That's what we're talking about collaboration. All right. Can you bring the microphone over here to this gentleman? I thank you. I'm going to warn you at first up uh, front that this is part commercial and part question. Uh, uh, the commercial aspect of this is uh, Jeff Moore. I serve as the managing director of climate finance at the, the Development Finance Corporation, uh, which is a DFI, and it seeks out opportunities in developing countries and uh, emerging markets uh, along these lines in climate. And so I guess my question for the three of you is, uh, have you engaged uh, DFIs? And if, are you willing to engage DFIs? If so, we should talk afterwards. <laughs> Great. Who wants to start? Have you engaged DFIs? Well, uh, I think we haven't gotten to the stage or scale yet 
to engage a DFI is what I thought. But now that I met my friend Jeff here, <laughs> so <laughs> the conversation will start right away. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for that. Yeah, we haven't either, but we would love to talk more. Thank you. Yeah, so now part uh, we have to an extent, uh, but um, yeah, we're happy to engage as well once we're done. Thanks a lot. <laughs> so embedded in that is the, the preconception that there's a scale requirement for DFIs, right? Yeah. Um, and that the, the barriers to engaging, the bottlenecks, the red tape is pretty, pretty sizable. And so it would be interesting on another panel another day to talk about how SMEs can become part of the pipeline for many of the DFIs. We'll also figure out, uh, yeah. as we both talk, if scale with Gov can actually be a plug-in between uh, the climate ventures and DFIs too. Exactly. Yeah. Fantastic, exactly. fantastic. Well done. So you have three potential customers here. <laughs> All right, we had another, yeah, go ahead. We can take two questions at the same time since we have two on the same row. Hi, um, I'm Emma Olivares. I'm, from, I'm still a sophomore in Booker T High School at, and I'm here from Achieve Miami. And I want to start a business after high school and go into college for that. And I was just wondering, what's a good way to start a eco-friendly business? Like, what's a good way to just start with that and you know, build up from that as you go? So. Wonderful. So, first of Can all, a big round of applause big round of for applause, her yes. wanting to start a business. I have yes. to say that I'm so inspired by the young people we've been meeting here. Sophomore in high school, so confident, capable. I met a freshman at Rutgers, really impressive. Just re a shout out to the young people who are doing great things for climate. <laughs> all right. Yeah, hi, my name is Sasank and I work on agriculture, improving soil health. Um, I really liked how all of you focused on b building what I call a public-private partnerships working with governments. Something I am curious about in working with governments is how have you thought about political un instability affecting your work and forming government partnerships, leveraging them effectively, but also being cautious in case of political transitions, for example? Great question. So let's start with starting a business. Yeah. Uh, so starting a business, my first advice is don't wait until you finish. You can start drafting your ideas, talk to people, listen to people. Like you might think you have the best idea, but probably uh, if you spin it a little bit, it will be the best. Uh, I would say like, yeah, when you, once you have your idea clear, approach to your teachers and approach. There are a lot of government funds uh, available to begin like structuring the business. And yeah, I, I would need to know a little bit more about your idea before I can tell you more, but I would be happy to help and reach out to other entrepreneurs in the same areas. We're also always like helping with our net network, like, oh, I met this investor, I met this person who would be helpful. Don't be ashamed to reach out. We're always like supporting the ecosystem. And just to add, it's always good to have internships, right, in yeah. similar sectors so you can learn from the mistakes of others. Yeah. And all of, all of us benefited from yeah. internships. And then consider Ashoka. They actually have a Young Change Makers pipeline. Have you heard of Ashoka? So look it up. They have a, a young, I think from 15 up to 25, where they'll put you in a fellowship and help you launch your idea. So there are lots of initiatives like that. So check them out. Great, and then instability and how do you deal with changes in government, managing risk? That's a very legitimate uh, question. This is um, a joke from uh, California where um, apparently there is always, uh, you know, uh, there are these senators who come and go and uh, there are these officials uh, who are, you know, more long term. So the officials uh, tell the senators whenever they come in that, you are the A team, right? And we are the B team, we are the officials or bureaucrats, we are the B team, but we are here to be, right? <laughs> so I think it really helps um, if you build relationships with bureaucrats a little more than the ones with the politicians and navigate through them so that you can also, cho you can choose, right? I mean. It's not, you don't have to be married only to one state 
or one country. So you can figure out where the environment is right for scaling your idea. So, yeah. Great points. Ayala, what about you? How have you navigated this? Well, we've not done too much of government deals, but I mean, just one. Uh, but I would, I would think it's basically relationships, like he, he purely said. I think if you develop relations to the right um, um, set of, like in my former life, I, I did a few. And uh, yeah, it was purely relationship. At the end of the day, that's just what the political office orders, but with the, uh, the ministry uh, heads that have been there over the years. Uh, so when there are changes in political power, at least you're sure that the head of the ministry who has been there for several years will still be there. Uh, so uh, that uh, and that has been helpful because even now that we uh, started a cool box, I had to just give them a call. They were still there, and then we got the product into the outer state. So yeah, that's uh, the little I knew about that. I'm, I'm not sure, sure that would be helpful, but. <laughs> and a disclaimer: I'm not from California. I heard this joke from a friend of mine. <laughs> Yeah, and well, as I said before, this communication, like communicate uh, with them that uh, you are trying to achieve the same goals. If you can like push a little bit deeper and create public policy together with them, so that will remain after the person is gone. And also, I think the, the other advice would be sometimes it is just impossible. Like, for example, I am from Mexico and I would love to be working more for Mexico. But right now, the level of corruption in, in the context is super high. So I would be wasting a lot of time if I focus all my energy in a market that is not ready because of these political conditions. So just uh, try to move like in other countries where where the, the, the political like will is better and then you can come back like with a proven concept and a proven like public policy or regulations and help the ones that are like in more vulnerable politic context. And just to add one, one point to that, um, I've worked a lot with government over the last 25 years. Oh, don't always focus on national, right? We have states, we have local, and oftentimes you find political will in a local government or a state government Every government likes to support winning teams, yeah. right? And they want to get the credit, even if they didn't help you. So be prepared to share that credit. Always invite them to your opening of events or yeah. launching of things and, and make them feel very, very happy that they are part of the success story. Yeah. They'll support you through uh, as administrations change because they say, that's a winner. I want to be part of that team. Yeah. And then the third thing is, in every government, you should map your ecosystem. So who are the champions? Who are the opponents? Who are who feel like they have something to lose? How can you convert them from opponents to champions? And you have to be very strategic about that power map. Be careful because sometimes you think one person is your champion, they might actually be an opponent or vice versa. And in some communities, it's the traditional ruler that's the change agent. Another community might be the priest that's even more powerful than the government official. So be very, very nuanced about who the power brokers are and how you build relationships with them. And just to make it a little more concrete, one example, one friend of mine who does exactly, you know, something like this, to get a regulation on road safety, he mapped out the 542, uh, you know, elected representatives in Indian parliament. And he did so much homework to see if, if anybody had any uh, incident in their family of road accident. And actually went and shared the idea with people who unfortunately had those events and suddenly it caught their imagination and he built those champions now it's it takes homework right nothing is easy this is also going to take a lot of homework but it needs uh, you know if you do it smartly hopefully it starts paying off definitely yeah andreas um so my name is andres i'm a student at rutgers university um, but I was raised here in Miami, um, not to like throw us under the bus or anything, but it's extremely difficult to incentivize change in this town. And I've kind of dedicated my career and my schooling to incentivizing sustainable development and incentivizing change, not just with money, but through any means necessary. What do you guys have to say about that? <laughs> Okay, what's the question I, there? 
how how do you guys do it? How do you how do you incentivize change? Because we have a paradigm that we've been following since what World War Two. Um, so how do you how do you get your product to to the market? How do you how do you incentivize people to change their way of life? Just uh, without burning out. He's already sounding very jaded yeah, as a young yeah. man. Yeah, actually, <laughs> no, it, I, I actually thought that this guy must be like 83 year old who <laughs> had been trying for three generations to change something in Miami, but you know, on a lighter note. Um, look, change is hard, right? There's no question, right? This is hard work. If anybody in this conference came into this conference thinking that this was easy, obviously this is not true, right? Um, I think I would really encourage you to think about going with people who probably could be your allies, right? First, identify your allies. Again, going to that point, find your friends, find your collaborators. What are the NGOs? Who are the actors, activists, or organizations who could be your allies? Start talking to them because a lot of your helplessness or exhaustion, I feel, comes from that feeling of doing all this alone, right? And, uh, Find a tribe, keep fighting. There's no easy answer. Any other additions? Yeah, um, I agree. I agree. Just uh, look like there's so much people like thirsty for change. So many all over the world. If you don't find like me, like if you don't find it in your hometown, go out. Like reach out to everybody. That's uh, like if you're alone, you can do only this little. If you have a tribe, as he said, you can reach to so much more yeah i think they, they said everything <laughs> <laughs> All right. including us yes yeah. feel free to reach out go ahead yeah thank you so much for your incredible work and um so my name is toko and i'm a graduate student at yale school of the environment so my question really is building upon mapping these ecosystems and just recognizing that we are operating in a global system but i'm so moved by your incredible work which is you are from these areas and you're helping to create the change as people that understand uh with the geographical area so really i'm curious about how you are able to navigate these ecosystems of whether it's competitive or whether it's collaborative. And I am from Zambia and within this context, there's a lot of someone can have an idea, but they don't have as much money. And like someone from the Netherlands can come and start a big operation or someone from China can come and start a big operation. So I'm wondering how in your situations you navigate or are able to overcome competition and how you foster these collaborate collabor collaborations within a global system <laughs> thank you all right Ayala, do you want to start yeah thanks I uh, hope if I understand your question well uh, for me um, yeah having come from Nigeria originally um, I should rightly said I uh, and I do understand what you're talking about in terms of sometimes funding could be a huge challenge and all that um, a lot of people tend to think, oh, yeah, but because you guys are in France, it's, uh, I'll tell you it's the same. Yeah, the, the truth is um, you just have to start small. Uh, listen to the people. Ensure that you listen. I think that's the first thing. You need to be sure that you're solving a real problem because then if you're not, you know, there's really no point. But when you have a problem that you want to solve, you'll be shocked at the number of people that are willing to solve with you. You know, just to add, so there were some statistics. I wrote a whole article about this. Of the 10 startups that got funding in Kenya, only two were Kenyan. The other eight were Americans, Europeans who came to Kenya and they could get funding. So there's an implicit bias that a lot of startups in many countries within the continent face, and you see this in many emerging economies. There's an instant credibility when you come from another part of the world and operate in that environment that we who live there have to almost prove and prove and prove and prove ourselves. But one of the things you might want to do from if you have an idea is to say, what are the skills I have? What are the gaps in my skill set to solve that problem? And how can I find partners in other parts of the world to fill those gaps? They can add to your credibility, your experience base, but also have a board. For every organization I've started, after I write my concept note, I appoint my board. Because I'm young, I started at 25. That was the first organization. Well, nobody will listen to me in a context that's very patriarchal and you know, there's a lot of ageism. So if you have a board of distinguished people 
then people say, okay, I don't know Nidhi, but I know these other four people. Um, and then as you build your reputation, it gets easier to raise the money and to find the partnerships. And then people start coming to you. You don't have to look for them anymore. Uh, but I, I have a copy of one of my books I'll give you today. Perfect. She gets the book. <laughs> Plus one, uh, just want to add a point yes. to what you said. I think there is nothing to beat power of proximity. If you're close to the work that you're doing, you have deep insights. And I'm sure you're a smart person who can articulate those insights. So power of proximity. And another point to uh, answer what you said, I made peace with this. Being an entrepreneur from India, when we have to fundraise for climate work, this is what uh, happened multiple times, but I stopped looking at this as a problem. I look at, I today look at this as a feature. Maybe first time when I rate mail asking for an appointment, I don't get an appointment. I know that I have to write three to four mails to get an appointment. And earlier I used to look at that situation with a frustration. Today, I accepted that as a process to say, I'll do it. Okay. This is a part of the game. I'll do it. So somewhere prox power of proximity and power of persuasion, um, of course, with you know, great advisors and board on your side will set you up for success. Thank you. All right, a question here. Hi, my name is Maria Elmar and thank you again for this wonderful conversation. It's great to hear from all of you truly. Um, so my question is, sometimes when you're dealing to trying to find your client, your customer, particularly when you're working with communities that may not know about your technology or may not have the access to learn about your technology. Can you talk to us a little bit about how you're reaching those people? And I just want to take one moment and tell um, Andres, I guess. I, I do live here in Miami and completely understand your sentiment and something that has worked in my experience have been able to educate our leaders and our politicians, but also come up with solutions um, where, where when you come in and, and you, you share the sentiment of the community, and get together with the community, oftentimes you find solutions that they may not be aware of. Um, so that's been a success story that I've had the privilege to, you know, see. So thank Terrific. you. Terrific. Thank you. And that's another ally for you, Andreas. Yeah. All right. So let's take the responses to that question. I missed the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thrilled with your, yeah, How I was thrilled you with your. How do you get your customers to, yeah. so, yeah, yeah. adoption? That yeah. I can probably take a shot. Oh, sorry, are you going no, for you can go. Um, I would suggest go with the one who has the greatest chance of picking it up and least prerequisites. I'll contextualize it for what we do. If we have to set up a greenhouse, well, you go to a place where there is no bore well, there is no water, and find a well. Find, oh, no, 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 don't do all of that, right? Go to a place where, uh, in this greenhouse, are we going to grow vegetables? Great, okay. Are we going to use drip irrigation? Yes, okay. Go to a place where there already, the drip irrigation already exists. Vegetable growing is already happening. And the least minimum thing with which your technology can work properly is your first place where you should put it to and then start adding more challenges. So this is my view. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, um, I'll jump on what he said, basically. Um, so what we did in Coopbox, we actually started really small and we iterated along the way. Um, so we had initially started from the camping world, looking at the kind of offering we have and based in France, so we started from the camping world. And despite the numerous successes we had from, from retailers like Carrefour, I don't know if you guys know Carrefour, it's like the, the Walmart of, of, of America. So we had, uh, yeah, uh, but it didn't take us so long to realize that the solution we have, like he said, would actually be better suited for people that need it the most. People that lose about 40% of their produce before it gets to the market. People that labor day and night only to buy produce and throw it away the next day because they do not have power supply. So like he rightly said, it didn't take us too long to find out where the low hanging fruit is. And we went straight up for that with our technology. And the story has never been the same. Even though we had opportunities with the Walmarts, but clearly when you have a direct, I don't know who was saying that today, that when you have a real uh, case with a, a customer that's in need, it's different from a customer that's in want. It, they're two different worlds. 
So I think, uh, yeah, I, I would go with what he said, basically. Go for the low-hanging fruit, people that really need your technology, and go hard. It might look good, like you might be able to serve some other communities as well, but I think you should go for the low-hanging fruit, where you think your products will be very effective. For us, it's uh, a little bit um, complicated, but fun, I have to admit. So we have on one hand like these hotel owners, uh, like clients, but we also have governments, but we also have United Nations and then the coastal communities. So of course, each one of these you have to approach in different ways. So some are just uh, going to events, some are just uh, through LinkedIn, uh, like try to get people to read, contact all, all the fellows that are working on the same space that you're working. Uh, and then for the communities, uh, especially in the Caribbean, for us, we just go to the communities, we talk to the fishermen, we talk uh, to the affected, uh, like the people living by the coast. I, I was working for one month in a boat, like a sailor, the harvesting sargasso to understand what was happening. So it takes both the fancy parties with government people, but also like take off your shoes, jump in the ocean, talk to people. Yeah. Thank you so much. So we're almost out of time. Um, I think we have uh, four minutes left. So I'm going to ask us to give our charge. So you have a room full of diverse people, students, young people. You have financiers. You have entrepreneurs. If you had a charge to give them about the future of entrepreneurs and the climate movement, what would that charge be? What needs to change? What can they do differently leaving this room? Like take action now like it is already a little bit late if you're here you have the interest already reach out to people uh, like us if you want to support and or if you think you can help us uh, scale faster but act yeah um i would say um yeah it's never really easy um, i feel your pains when you talked about funding and all that you know to scale your dream it's tough and I will be realistic with you, it's very tough. Uh, wherever you come from, wherever you are, is extremely hard. And so I would just say, like the Boy Scout, be prepared. <laughs> yeah. First thing, you can find me on LinkedIn. And uh, we can connect, talk. Because when we say we'll collaborate in all these conversations, we have conferences, we just keep saying collab we'll collaborate. But how, right? Step one, we need to talk. We need to listen to each other. A lot changes when we can listen to each other because at the heart, all of us want great world for the generations to come. And for that, it begins with listening to each other and making sure that we figure out, hey, these are the ways in which we can collaborate. All those will follow. But I'm absolutely game for any 15 to 20 minute conversations. You know, I just do that like every day. Uh, quite regularly so feel free to hit me up on uh, LinkedIn and we'll set up time and talk and figure out how we can collaborate in this regard. Well I want to thank these great panelists thank you for your insights thank you for your courage your passion your vision and we are rooting for you to succeed. My favorite African proverb says if you want to go fast go alone if you want to go far go with others but I've modified it a little we must go fast and far together. And to do that, we need to leave our egos and logos at the door and work with integrity and humility, listening, learning, collaborating, and being prepared. So join me in thanking this wonderful group for an excellent panel.